Today on a bench we have a Motorola model CB555. So this is the uh, base station version of the, the mobile radio. It actually uses the, uh, and I, I think I've done a video on one of these before. Um, it is the mobile radio shoved into a box with a power supply and a clock. Um, you can see the bracket, that's the same bracket used in the mobile radio and even has the mounting holes for your, you know, your nuts that hold the radio onto the bracket in the mobile. And that's not uncommon for manufacturers to do that. You make a great radio, why change it? Just basically don't stick a top and bottom cover on it. Stick it in a, in a larger box with a power supply. So, uh, oh. Actually had it hooked up to an antenna. There's really nothing on air right now. The skip was really rolling in earlier today, but yeah, it's really died down. Um, so the customer sent this one in, basically just have an alignment done to it. Um, didn't really want anything else done to it. Just make sure it's working fine. So that's what was done to it. Basically just an alignment. Uh, clean the, the dust bunnies out of the inside. A little bit of cleaning on the outside, and it's a good working radio. So it's all original electrolytic capacitors, and it has, honestly, I think I can say I'm probably the first person to be in here. Somebody else may have had to cover off of it, but I'm the first person that's actually done anything to it since it was built. So it's never had an alignment, no modifications, no nothing, which, honestly, that's the kind of radios I like to get. I so many radios I spend three times more undoing stuff than it does to actually the basic stuff you might need to do to a radio so this one was a pleasure to work on <laughs> uh, now these radios are a pain in the hoo-ha when it comes to actually working on them uh, even the alignments a little bit tricky um, and it's not that it's complicated it's basically you know more or less the same procedures you use with most, most radios. It's just accessibility. And the accessibility issue is not just the alignment. If you ever have to replace a component on this board, it's, I don't want to say nightmare, but they are a pain in the hoo-ha. <laughs> the problem is, is the way they have, they mounted this in here with this faceplate and the power supply. Yeah, it's it's a chore just to get this thing up and out, and even then you can't really get it. You kind of have to prop it up sideways in here, and yeah, it's a royal pain. <laughs> so if you only want to do an alignment to one of these without butchering it, and what I mean by that is if we look down here at the PLL synthesizer circuit, so that's everything inside of this RF shielding can right here. Actually, I think the more I think about that, I did do a video on one of these where someone had cut out the top of this plastic can, and I had to make a cover plate to solder on there to fill this thing back in. But so you don't have to cut holes in this, you can do an alignment on one of these radios without lifting this entire chassis up. It will take you a lot. It's 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 tedious and very, I guess you could almost say meticulous doing it, but it's still faster than trying to remove this chassis because removing this chassis take my word for it is a pain it, it it's just there's if there were <laughs> i'm not sure how to put this uh, they dropped the ball on this and they didn't drop the ball off of a cliff they went to mount everest and dropped the ball <laughs> when they, they designed this cabinet because it's just a royal pain getting this chassis out so Anything you can do to not remove it, I suggest doing. So the problem is when it comes to doing the alignment of the synthesizer circuit. Getting to the alignment points themselves is easy. You can see there's already holes in the can for the trimmer, trimmer capacitors here, and there's two tunable transformers, one here and here. The problem is, is getting to the test points. There's no holes for you to get down into where the parts are. You need to be probing to actually do, to do the alignment. So, for starters, the first thing you need, service information. That's the most important tool you can have. All the fancy test equipment in the world is not going to do you any good unless you have all of this stuff, service information. So, there's a SAMS manual, there's a copy of the SAMS manual, there's a schematic. And this is exactly how I had it laid out while I was doing the alignment procedure. Because this is one of those reviews, because of this limited access synthesizer circuit, you really need to have the alignment procedure here, 
but you need to be able to look at your schematic and look at the board layout diagram at the same time. So it's always nice to make copies of stuff so you can do that. You can lay out multiple sections of a manual across your bench because uh, one, of the, one of the points, alignment points in here, it's hidden inside of here and you cannot get to it. But if you just look at the schematic, find that, find that point on the schematic, you'll also notice that that trace runs outside of this can and you can just simply pick it up back here at a ceramic coupling capacitor before it goes into the mixer here. So that one's problem solved. You don't have to worry about getting to that point inside the can. You can just access it, access it externally. Uh, other alignment points, you're not so lucky. Now there, it just comes in with a little bit, just turn it off here, unplug the mic, which this radio does have the original microphone with it. Always nice to see. So you'll need to get a little bit ingenuitive, I guess you could say. Uh, let me just disconnect all this stuff. It's a little bit easier to turn around. So the problem child is the Veractor diode, or I should say it's not a problem, but getting to it is the problem. It's located right about here, pretty much centered right between this hole and this hole. And there's no hole here to get to it to probe. So on the schematic, the test points you want to get to, and they don't actually have the test points labeled on here. You actually have to kind of look at the, the board layout diagram and then mark them out on here. But is this test point? Yeah, right here. TP2. You can see the Veractor diode. Well, that's the point we want to get to. But, like I say, it's right here. Now, it's one of the Motorola Veractor diodes. So, unlike uh, most people, if you're familiar with the diode, looks just like this little guy right... Actually, there's several of them down here. You know, little glass diodes, like everybody's seen. The Veractor diodes, these were actually made by Motorola. And they look more like a... Hmm. <laughs> a miniature IC, I guess you could say. It's a small little black uh, plastic packaged, you know, like I say, it looks, it's hard to describe, and I, of course I can't show you through the can, but it looks like an IC, only it's tiny and only has two leads. Um, so what you can do to get down into it is, now this entire area inside of this can, and there's a one heck of a glare move the camera down a little bit, try and get rid of that glare. Now you can get to it, and, and what you need to get to that for is to adjust your VCO voltage. Um, it is accessible, it's just challenging. <laughs> the first challenge is, this entire area here, underside of this can, is sealed in wax. So the wax is about that deep in there. And pardon my black hands working on a, on a tractor, I had to split a tractor in half and put a clutch in. So it's going to take a few days to wear off all this <laughs> 80 and 90 year old grease. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this entire area is potted in, in wax. Now that's an advantage. Wax is easily scraped out if you could get to it. So this is where, you know, kind of modifying tools comes in handy and whatnot. So what I have here is just, I think they call these spatulas. Uh, it's a dental pick, but it has a flattened end on one end. Um, I use these for removing ICs and also removing wax and removing Sony Bond, the corrosive glue out of radios. But with this and a flashlight, <laughs> you can get enough of that wax out that you can actually see it then. So what I do is, is remove this cable, allows me to hold my flashlight, shine it down, and hold. matter of fact, you can actually see the light down in there. That's that little line you see right there. That's actually the transformer can that's in there. Right behind that transformer can, running from here to here, is that diode in there. So what you want to do is just get down in there and basically scrape out, you know, looking down through that little hole, that's what I say. It's challenging, but it can be done. You can scrape the wax off of the top of that diode. Once you have this, the wax scraped away that you can see it, you can then use a homemade probe. So what you want to test is for voltage. So you're just going to be using a, a voltmeter. The problem is, a probe like this, so this, you know, just... This is designed to go on a probe like this. So we take our safety shield off and we stick this on here and it's a long needle probe. The problem is if you come in through here, you can't get it from this direction. And if you come in from this direction, there's other components back here. It just, it 
just barely, and I mean it's all so close, it just shoots over the top of it. You can't get it down, you can't get up at an angle far enough to get down to the lead, because you want to attach to this side. So the, you have a connection here and a connection on this side. You want to connect to the, the, the terminal on the side of this connector, but trying to get in there, it's just impossible with a straight you know, needle probe like this. But there is an easy way around that, and that's where it comes in, just a little bit of ingenuity. So just make your own probe, and let's see, where is that? Right there. So this is just a piece of spring steel. Uh, Lord knows how many printers I have discombobulated <laughs> over the years. Probably 50 or more. Um, and I love taking printers apart for one reason. Springs. There is all, oh, there is a plethora of springs to be had inside of laser printers and inkjet printers. And this was just a, not a coil spring, but just a, you know, piece of spring steel. But I, this end was already like that, and the other end was just straight. So I bent it in an angle. Well, actually, the first thing I did was, was I, now this is spring steel, so you're not going to be able to file this with a file. You'll need a grinding stone or you know, a wheel. But I ground it down to a very sharp point. Then I bent it at an angle and just put a piece of heat shrink tube, tubing over it, just like Fluke does with their meter leads. That's basically all that black is. They just put a piece of heat shrink tubing over it for insulation because it is going to be resting against this metal can, and you don't want to short that out. But I just make up a probe because that's the problem. The normal probe just kind of shoots over top of it. But with this, you can get this down in there, twist it around, get into that diode, and then just clip on with an alligator clip and measure your voltage. But this allows you to get down over those components you can't normally get to, actually touch the lead of that diode. So there is a tip for how not to have to cut holes in this can. Um, and actually there's one other uh, test point in this. TP, I believe it's TP3. Let me just look at the service manual here. Uh, yes, TP3. Pin number 17 of IC602, your PLL. And again, the problem with getting to TP3, where they tell you on, if we look at it on the board layout diagram, it's right, where are we at here? TP3, it's right there, okay? But you can see, and that's why it pays to have the service manual, it also has the circuit traces in this grayscale, okay? You can see TP3 is actually attached to pin 17. Now, we're really fortunate there. There's a hole right here, so you can get down. Now, you're going to need to get down in there with your uh, uh, probe. Um, so, actually, let me grab one. Again, the little needle probes. The oscilloscope probe that I have here has an optional probe tip for it. And it's basically just like the fluke meter leads. Makes a nice long, you know, piece of heat shrink tubing over it. Again, you could you could jury rig up something like this yourself, but that allows you to get down in to pin 17 of the IC. It's tricky. Again, you need a flashlight. You need three hands to do it. But it's one of those things. It's not impossible. So when someone tells you, you know, oh, you can't do an alignment on one of these without the hassle of having to remove this chassis. From the, from the radio cabinet, that's not true. It can be done. It just takes a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of you know, fabrication of your own probe tips, um, and patience. But trust me, it will save you time. It's faster doing this than it is trying to... And not only that, usually when you pull one of these things up and out, you're going to end up breaking a wire or two off. There's terminals, there's just all these wires that interconnect in between the clock module. Because <laughs> you have to remember, the clock can also turn the radio on. It's got an auto function. Um, and the power supply, it's just so much easier if you don't take this chassis out of this cabinet. It's going to save you so much time doing it this way. And then once you have your little probe tip like this, well, you've got it forever now. So the next time you have to do one of these, you'll have it. Uh, let's see, is there any other advice? Ah, missing pages. There is a missing page. So the service manual, when Sam's, because you have to remember, this is the second to last Sam's manual that was ever produced. And these manuals were not print. Well, the, 
the service information here was not made by SAMS. Unlike most all of the earlier versions where SAMS actually made the service literature, what SAMS started doing towards the end was just copying the manufacturer. They got the manufacturer's you know, authorization to do it, because you can see here, courtesy of Craig for this, this radio. But they just reprinted the manufacturer's alignment, or, you know, service manual, in, in, and then, you know, bound it in their own book. The problem is, apparently, when Sam's did that, they lost a page. Because <laughs> if we go to the Motorola, you get to this point right here, where you're aligning the receiver. And you see how those lines just kind of continue down? Well, when it, when it comes to an end, it's supposed to be a line at the bottom. What's missing here is there's nothing to tell you how to... Now, it tells you how to do to align the receiver. There's only three adjustments. Uh, actually, I'm in, the, I'm in the wrong section, ain't I? Yeah, that's actually the next page here. This section, let's try that again. <laughs> there's these three points here you align for, max, for your receiver sensitivity. The problem is they fail to tell you how to adjust your receive signal meter and the squelch. So... Those two adjustments, I'll just show them here. Uh, let's grab something here. So this adjustment, so down on the main circuit board down here, one's actually underneath this shield down on the board. You really have to get it in an angle with your adjuster tool, and the other one's straight down in here. But this adjustment right here is the signal meter. So you just put 100 microvolts EMF into this, or 50 microvolts into 50 ohms, and you're going to adjust this trimmer right here for a signal strength of S9 on the meter in the radio. And then this potentiometer right here, a trimmer resistor, is used to adjust for your squelch. So you'll put 1,000 microvolts into the radio, turn the squelch up the whole way, and adjust this until the squelch just breaks. But yeah, that's two points. Two, uh, that's the only two, but those are the two points that are missed in this service manual. Um, and I've never seen them printed anywhere because I don't have an original copy of the Motorola, but I'm assuming it's just missing. It, you, know, you go to the next page, and yeah, you come to the uh, basically your uh, binary chart for the PLL. Yeah, so it's, it's like they missed a page. So if you ever run into that, you're doing an alignment on one of these. This is your signal meter. This is your squelch adjustment. Um, and I think that pretty much covers this radio. Uh, like I say, I've done, done them on these before. They're really great radios. They receive really well, sound really good. Now, these are not AM monsters. Uh, the Motorola's, of course, were known for superb operation in sideband, um, and that's why people want them, and that's what they're really good at, sideband. Um, you know, they can pull, as I say, they can pull a mouse fart out of the, the pile up at 100 yards. <laughs> I mean, they just really super sensitive receivers, and they're quiet because they have good filtering. Now, it's not a gigantic crystal filter, but it was a really well-designed crystal filter, um, and it's fairly narrow, so it really does help to cut out noise. So there you go. There's just another Motorola CB555 ready to put back into service.